That looks pretty good. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to talk to you. Um, uh, and thank you also for, uh, to me for preparing this opportunity. It is truly a pleasure to talk to an audience like you because uh, from what I've been gathering, both through me but also through the previous comments, this is a group of people that have a very clear focus on a certain specific problem, which is how to make learning analytics applications effective. But the other very bit that is in, very important for me is to make impact at scale, so not just uh, small pilot information. I have quite a lot of information and quite a lot of details because one of the things that we found in the past engaging with other institutions is that it helps a lot to clarify the context in which learning analytics needs to be deployed, the different bits and pieces, how does it connect with other elements, and then also having a little bit of a discussion about how to achieve effective institutional uh, uptake. So hopefully these are all things that will resonate with this group. What you have in front of you now is the starting point, which for this audience, I think it's already everyone is familiar with the definition. What are we trying to achieve here? The reason why I put that definition in there is due to the two words that I highlighted, understanding and optimizing. At the end of the day, no matter what we do at the level of institution, no matter what we do when we connect with other stakeholders group, we need to be able to come back and connect our activities with the need to increase our understanding and optimize the learning experiences. So hopefully this is something that we all agree that this is what we're trying to achieve. Now, the other thing I'd like to uh, cover very quickly before we start to get into a bit more details is a little bit of clarification between what we understand by learning analytics and some other big words that are happening out, out there. We live in a very confusing time. We live in a time where there are a lot of buzzwords and, and definitions out there. And sometimes it's a little bit challenging. Even for me, my technology, my background is technology, is computer science engineering. Even for me, it gets a little bit confused, confusing to, to differentiate one from the other. What you have in front of you in the screen is try to establish a bit of a relationship between learning analytics and big data. Big data, it's a broad term. It's something very generic. And it's basically described vaguely as an area in which the data is used for increasing our understanding, but at a large scale. So when data sets are very, very large, right? And by very large, we're talking things that are very difficult to manipulate. You cannot do something like open my data set and make a query because it's very expensive. And that's why the term big data means all the technological infrastructure that allows us to manipulate large amount of data, which is probably the case of your um, context, right? For you in Singapore. And therefore, this is something that you have to keep in mind. What we maintain from the area of big data in learning analytics is that we definitely need to collect and store these data sets. We need to analyze them and we need to generate reports. And this is the intersection between learning analytics and big data. However, we may have institutions, we may have experiments, we may have pilots that do not have such a large number of data or such a large uh, volume <coughs> of data store. In that case, that intersection disappears. So from my point of view, and what I'd like you to, to come up uh, to conclude is that learning analytics is an area that may use as part of its activity partially certain areas of big data if we found ourselves in that specific context when we collect, store, analyze, and have to report and visualize enormous amount of data, okay? If not, learning analytics still preserves its essence. It's just that it does not overlap with big data as much as we like. The reason why I'm telling you this is because you may find yourself standing in context, especially talking to vendors, that they pitch to you big data solutions. And you have to be a little bit careful and identify what part of my problem really uh, intersects or overlaps with that solution for big data and which parts of my problem do not. And hopefully over the next hour, I'll give you a lots, of other, lots of other pieces and bits and pieces for you to clarify this distinction. Okay, another area that is also gaining a lot of traction is educational data mining. And this is probably the closest one to learning analytics. What do we understand by educational data mining? If we choose the, if, we, if you select the official definition, educational data mining or EDM explores how algorithms can automatically predict or extract knowledge from existing data about learning. This is very important because the field is mostly focused on algorithms. 
Now, these algorithms obviously have to process data that comes from learning environments, and these data can then needs to be used to make predictions or to create models. But this is in a nutshell the area. Now, you begin to see how things start getting confusing, right? Is there an overlap between educational data mining and big data? What we discussed before? Obviously, yes, because if these algorithms have to manipulate large data sets, then clearly EDM will use some big data te techniques. Is there an overlap between learning analytics and educational data mining? Absolutely, both of them are focused around learning. The main difference perhaps is that EDM focus about the algorithms. How do we use the algorithms? What kind of clustering algorithms are needed or which ones are effective? Or do I need to predict the behavior of my students using, I don't know, um, support vector machines or any other techniques that are out there? That would be in the realm of educational data mining. The focus then is on the algorithm, on the predictions, on identifying relationships among variables. So from that point of view, learning analytics, we can say that uses EDM as one of its components. It's not the only one because as I'm going to show you in a second, there is quite a lot of human dimensions in there that we also bring under the umbrella of learning analytics. But definitely one of them is which algorithms do we have to process this data? Another area that is very interesting, intelligent tutoring systems. This is also an area that has been established a long time ago, but in here, the difference is much more substantial. What we are trying to do is use technology to model a specific tutoring scenario. So out of all different ways a student can learn, we focus on a tutoring session. A tutoring session is someone trying to learn certain concepts and somebody else tutoring that session. What we are trying to do with ITS is create programs that simulate that tutoring scenario. These programs are fairly sophisticated and include quite a lot of uh, elements. Like for example, we need to capture what is the status of the, of the student. So there is a model of the student skill acquisition. We need to model the knowledge domain. Typically ITS are very specific to one topic. For example, year 10 geometry. And it's a program that models the concepts of year 10 geometry, how students acquire the skills that are um, the target of, or the goals of that model. They also tend to estimate student errors, misconceptions. You find models that characterize how students misunderstand geometry concepts in year 10. So as you can see, it's very specific and it's focusing always on a tutoring relationship, which is not necessarily the case for learning analytics, a bit more broad. And learning analytics is, is proposing to use algorithms to predict and detect and increase our understanding, but not necessarily to simulate a tutoring system. I hope this is helpful to clarify the different bits and pieces. So ITS is a bit more specialized on a single scenario, the tutoring scenario. ITS typically require quite a substantial amount of resources to create these models. Because as soon as you have a perfect model of how students learn their 10 geometry, you probably need another one that is substantially different to understand how students uh, learn literacy or obtain literacy skills in year 11 or year 12. So ITS are highly specialized, but you typically need to replicate them several times. Another area that is now getting a lot of traction is machine learning. And machine learning, this term comes directly from the context of computer science. And it's basically a family of algorithms. And these algorithms are specialized on how to build models automatically. And models are abstractions, simplifications of reality. Is it relevant to learning? Of course, because these algorithms, the machine learning algorithms, may be able to create or discover relationships or models in our data sets. And that's why we hear that machine learning is helping with learning because these algorithms may be applied to that. These models, remember, are simplified rep representation of a complex environment. Uh, the typical algorithm or the typical example in machine learning is, one of them is association rule learning. And this is when we discover rules for events that are likely to be related. And those rules are discovered automatically. One machine learning algorithm could be the shopping patterns in a supermarket. Uh, customers that buy one element, buy, another, buy one product, buy another product. And these type of techniques can be applied in learning. But again, it's taking a generic technique, machine learning algorithms, and then localize them, contextualize them to the context of learning and therefore we need to redefine or we need to um, adjust quite a lot of concepts in terms of the algorithm, what kind of data is being used, what kind of research problem is being answered, so on and so forth. 
And finally, a bit more broad is anti artificial intelligence, the area of artificial intelligence. This is a much broader problem because what we're trying to do is replicate it intelligent thinking. And intelligent thinking, it's a much broader problem than just machine learning. Machine learning is actually considered a sub-discipline of artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is building models that are considered intelligent and therefore are much more complex than just models for uh, prediction. Uh, an example of artificial intelligence could be autonomous vehicles. So as you can see, we have lots of bits and pieces, lots of um, different disciplines, but some of them, or perhaps all of them, overlap one way or another with the concept of learning analytics. We can say that some learning analytics can belong to artificial intelligence if we say, or if we see, that those elements are replicated intelligent thinking. But this is a little bit of a push. So hopefully, covering all these things, um, I gave you a sense of the touching points, but still it's a bit difficult to understand exactly what is learning analytics and how is it used. And this is what we're going to tackle next. Um, first, one of the complexities- so, uh, We just stop for a second here and just ask the floor whether you have any questions about all- Yep, questions. absolutely. Okay, uh, again, I think it's very important to get the definitions right. So you'll hear educational data mining and uh, learning analytics bandied about, they're slightly different, right? When we think about learning analytics, we're usually focused just on the learner, helping the learner learn. This is why they're coupled oftentimes with ICS intelligent tutoring systems. When you think about adaptive learning, sometimes you will think of it in the context of a specific discipline, and that would mean more related to ITS. Okay. Then you've already had the, the workshop on AI, uh, so you uh, probably have uh, had a little bit of a recap now about the relationship between AI and machine learning. Hopefully that's clear to you. It's clear also that uh, a lot of techniques and learning analytics don't need AI. You, you know, you could use a spreadsheet uh, and you could get quite far with that type of work, you know, in Excel for certain things. But when you want to be able to do personalized feedback or adapt on the fly, something that needs immediate feedback, then you need to orchestrate a program. And there, uh, you know, you have to uh, engineer some bespoke solutions, which your staff may be engineering for you. So uh, this is a really good time to make sure we're all clear. Yes, yeah, sir. Perhaps to help uh, some of us who are a bit more visual, uh, how would you represent these different terminologies in, uh, let's say, uh, visual representation, say, the Venn diagram? Yes, so a, a good way to visualize this would be in the Venn diagram. So Abelardo, maybe you can, I was looking for, it's trying to see whether we have, uh, Okay, here. Mm -hmm. okay, I'll try to illustrate it. So, uh, Abelardo, do you want to help us uh, draw a Venn diagram? Or... <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so, if we put a, a big blob that would be learning analytics, and that blob, we're going to unpack it in the following slides in much more detail, that I would probably, the, the most, uh, the biggest overlap would be with EDM. Okay, so we would have a significant overlap in there. Um, I would then draw a, an additional overlap with all three areas, but mostly EDM with uh, machine learning. And then I would draw an overlap between machine learning, EDM with artificial intelligence as well, but a bit sl smaller. And then the area of big data, I would put it as something that we either have or have not to use depending on the size of the data and these overlaps the whole thing. So any of the elements of that Venn diagram are suitable to qualify as big data problems or not depending on the size of information we are gathering. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I would just say, you know, sometimes the role between AI and ML is sort of mixed. So I view AI is more broad than ML, uh, but uh, you know, it depends on the specific person you talk to. If you talk to someone from ML, they'll say AI is inside of ML and <laughs> that, right? So uh, definitely uh, AI and machine learning take from several different disciplines. They take from statistics and mathematics, as well as computer science and engineering. So it's, it's a little hard to compartmentalize. I'd just say, uh, again, the emphasis is mostly on the uh, integration of uh, learning analytics and educational data mining, as Abelardo said, mm -hmm. educational data mining looks more at the, the specific algorithms, and that's why it has more overlap with machine learning and AI aspects, right? But here, you know, we don't necessarily care about the algorithms. We want to engineer good outcomes for our students. 
save the time for our staff so that we can interact appropriately. So this is why we focus today is on learning analytics. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you for, for the opportunity to show this at 10 I so ITS, I think, okay, I, I think it would go uh, more somewhere in the middle, yeah, uh, of all of these. So it has a definitely <laughs> overlap of all of these systems, yeah. So a little hard to see where, where they overlap. Right? Okay. It, is, it is some, sorry, it's, it's more in the sense that uh, ITS is more specific in some ways, right, because it's looking at a specific discipline or a subject matter. And Abelardo said maybe not even just the subject matter, but for, for a particular year or uh, materials yeah. or uh, just a topic, a small yeah. topic in one year, yeah. Yes, just a specific topic. So that's why it has overlaps in everything, right? Because sometimes you want your uh, ITS to react immediately, because it's intelligent tutoring, it needs to react immediately. That means it must have some algorithms behind it that's backing it. But also, <coughs> you want to take the analytics that it's doing. Uh, and uh, understand it from a practitioner point of view, right? Because even though an ITS may be automated, certainly the teacher needs to get some feedback and the curriculum developer also needs to have a handle on what's going on. Right? Well, more interestingly, it's a matter of your skill set. If you go to build something from zero, usually would there be a hierarchy that would allow us to go take it and go? Yes, so we're going to go exactly to that. So uh, the next part of the talk after we've gotten through all the definitions is uh, what Alonardo will cover in, in setting up it from an institutional uh, viewpoint and seeing how we can go both top down and bottom up to, to create the appropriate analytic structure within an SLA. So you had a question, Ned? Oh, um, so just looking at the tutorials, and yes. I think Alonardo uh, said that big data may or may not the LA, LA may or may not be used as big data, so I think the big data set has to be somewhere. Yeah. Not not so much for it. It, it. It's also it's also sort of like this, right? So it's a little bit of a wrap. And ITS yeah. needs to be situated within AI. Um, mostly it, it, it would be within AI. Yes. So ITS, you usually have a user model, so some way of uh, estimating how well the student is coping with the subject matter. Right, and then the system is supposed to be able to adapt. Right, so I know many of us are interested in adaptive learning, so we'll try to cover a little bit of that in the use cases later on. Okay, so we'll turn it back to Abelardo. So, uh, if you go ahead, sorry. All right, so very interesting questions and and it's definitely the the evidence that uh, the audience knows what we're talking about and it's fantastic that you're beginning to form your own uh, mental picture of how these things overlap now we're going to take a deep dive and explain a little bit more the elements of learning analytics and we're going to keep connecting them to these previous elements we discussed so far the first thing that i'd like to to tell the audience so that we make sure we're all on the same page is that the concept of learning analytics will have uh, different levels. We are talking about the possibility of applying techniques at the national level, which is probably closer to your scenario or a region or a college, or we can go all the way down to a course or a subject. We can also apply them over time, different uh, time frames. And this is the reason why I mentioned this because you'll find a lot of evidence that is difficult to categorize because we mix all these things all the time, right? You may have something that goes on during a session, a one-hour session, or a semester perhaps, or a course, which is an entire year, or a program that comprises three or four years, or even lifelong learning initiatives. We also have a lot of elements in there, and this is part of the complexity with learning analytics. We've, we are not as, as specific or as restricted as a, an ITS, and we have to deal with things like assessment, the presence of textbooks, simulators, maybe physical spaces, and the number of approaches is very broad. So this is a very broad field. Very quickly, I'm not gonna linger too much on this. Um, as was already mentioned, this is an emerging field. We do have a society and um, the society is organizing events because the complexity of this area and the need of expertise from different places and different uh, areas has prompted the emergence of this uh, community. What I'm going to show you now, uh, all the publications that I'm going to be using, you'll have the references at the bottom of your screen. And since this is recorded and you have the information, you can access them. 
Another um, taxonomy that has been used in the past, this is a paper that is already eight years old, but I think it's relevant, the distinction between academic analytics and learning analytics. Learning analytics tends to be closer to the faculty and the learner, whereas academic analytics is more at the level of institution or the national or international context. The elements we're gonna see next are going to be applied to any of these levels in here and hopefully will help you add clarity about what we are trying to uh, achieve here. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to uh, walk slowly through a model that we've been using in the past to describe the different elements of learning analytics and how do they interact with each other. And in here is the key point now for you to start making these connections and even um, establish the relationship between areas like machine learning or artificial intelligence or educational data mining. So let me start with a very simple picture and let's assume we have a learning design. This learning design could be a learning experience, could be a year 12 semester, could be a first year university course, could be something a bit more complex. We always start with a learning design and this is where we have the expertise in the room to create the topics, the assessment, the activities, and typically what happens is that we intend some sort of usage of this learning design, okay? So everybody would agree so far, this design usually has some constraints. In other words, you may have to um, implement certain activities in a very specific way because at some point this design is going to go into an environment it's gonna have some constraints. And this is what is represented by node number two. So far, nothing new. Now, you will agree with me as well that typically what happens with that design, it is enacted or deployed or implemented. There are quite a variety of words that are chosen for this stage. But in order to simplify our discussion today, what we are going to assume is that we have a learning environment in which instructors and support personnel interact with the learners, which interact with a learning environment. And this could be something that happens in an LMS or the LMS together with some face-to-face -face or some combinations of these things. So far, so good. There is nothing um, special and new about this. The next element we try to capture here is what happens when we are enacting that. And as it was mentioned by Mr. Lee at the beginning, what we, what we do is we capture a lot of data. And this data can be automatically captured, but it could also be uh, obtained by humans or it could be even reported by learners. And that's why in that arrow, we capture all three things. Data capture automatically, self-report by learners or instructor nodes. What we're going to assume for the sake of this model is simply to say, we're going to assume that all these things are stored somewhere that we call the database. Now, as you can imagine, and most of you are already thinking, we're doing a huge simplification for this because this database may require fairly sophisticated infrastructure. And this is the first connection with the ecosystem of pieces that we are putting together here. Inside that node number six that says database, we may unpack it, we may expand it into techniques for data warehousing, sophisticated data coherent, coherency, um, sophisticated or even things like data lakes, um, institutional access to this data, uh, national access to this data, perhaps cloud platforms, but these are all included or in case in the database model. So this is basically a way for us to simplify or extract the level of complexity in the different bits and pieces. Again, so far, nothing new. What we have is comprehensive data capture of what happens in the enactment of a learning design. So far, so good, right? Now, the next element is when things start getting interesting. Typically, what happens is out of that database, node number six, there is going to be a process that we represent by node number seven. And this is where we're gonna bring part of our connection with machine learning, part of our connection with uh, artificial intelligence or even educational data mining, because there will be some algorithms that will implement that analysis stage. And as Min uh, perfectly mentioned before, this analysis stage could be very, very simple. It could be just you opening an Excel sheet and looking at the data and saying, oh, there is some conclusions that I can draw. Typically what happened, and this is when the model becomes interesting, what happens is out of this analysis stage, which again can be arbitrarily complex, it may require hours and hours and, and millions of investment. But at the end of the day, typically, one of the things that comes out of that analysis is a set of reports. And that's what is represented by arrow number eight, or sorry, uh, node number eight, the reporting. And this report, what usually happens is that it either goes back to the initial design, you see the redesign arrow all going all the way up, 
But very interesting, and this is the focus of learning analytics, the report node number eight goes back to the instructors. And these instructors come up with actions, node number nine. This is a very important one. These are the actions that are derived from the reports that themselves are derived from a more or less sophisticated analysis stage. So nodes seven, eight, and nine are very, very important. What happens with node number nine? Those actions could be something that we provide immediately to the learners. It could be some suggestions, it could be some personalized feedback, or it could be additional elements or changes that we inject in the learning environment. And this could be the prescription of additional activities, the personalized suggestions for the next exercise. And this is where we could potentially overlap a little bit with intelligent tutoring system. An intelligent tutoring system is a system that specializes in the relationship between learners, actions, and the learning environment. It just so happens that ITS typically do not require the intervention of a human, whereas in this model here, we do specifically represent the human in node number three. Does that make sense? So these are just sequence of stages that connect the various elements. All right, the next one is when we introduce another interesting line, which is what if from the report, from node number eight, the report, we directly provide that information to the learners. So this is to capture systems that automatically create certain reports, maybe some dashboards, maybe some suggestions, and those dashboards and suggestions are personalized for each student differently, and they are sent to node number four. So this arrow here captures those scenarios in which you bypass the instructors, you bypass the actions, and that report is directly sent to the learner. And there are some initiatives out there that have done that. Now, the next level of complexity in the model, and this is where a lot of complexity comes in, are nodes 10 and 11. This is when we understand or we, when we insert prediction. Now, before explaining you what we mean by prediction, let me take a step back. Look at this model right now. Look carefully at it and look at the elements that you have in there. Would you be able to tell me that you are already able to improve the quality of a learning experience just with the elements in this model? Can you do it or not? Yeah, probably you can, right? Because what you're doing is collecting a lot of data, using some algorithms to analyze what happens, reach some conclusions that you put in a report, and then there are lots of actions that can happen in there. You can involve the tutors, the instructors, you can go back to the designers and say, please readjust or redesign your model because this is what happens in these reports, or you can take these reports and give it to the learner. Now, the, the reason why I pause here is because this is already a very powerful model. This is already capturing a lot of the possibilities of learning analytics, and yet we haven't introduced prediction yet. The reason why we do it like this is because prediction is an additional level of complexity that sits on top of this existing model. So what I would like you to think is prediction as a much more sophisticated step that we put on top of this framework that is already in place. It does not make sense to have prediction unless you have a database that is collecting information, unless you have an analysis process, unless you have a reporting process, and the possibility of feeding the consequences of those reports to either actions, changes in the design, or feed it back to the learner. Now, under these premises, when we bring finally the prediction, nodes 10 and 11. Now the caveat with prediction is node number 10. In order to make predictions, <coughs> these predictions will be implemented using algorithms that are either belonging to the area of educational data mining or machine learning. This is where we get all the power of these algorithms. Machine learning, remember, were models that were allowing you to make predictions. The caveat though, node number 10, we need previous data to create these models machine learning algorithms need what they call the test data. Data that you feed first, and with that data, you make predictions. Let me give you an example. Suppose you want to predict the performance of the students at the end of certain semester in the exam. You need the data of the previous year. That data then needs to be given to the machine learning experts. They create the predictive model. Once you have the model, then you insert the model in this drawing that we have here. And then is when you look at the database of the students that are currently taking a course and the machine learning algorithm will tell you based on what we have observed, our predictive final score is this one. But it's just a prediction based on the observed behavior the previous year. <coughs> just for the sake of uh, making sure that we're all on the same page. Again, if we remove this part of the model, 
if we remove prediction, we are still able to call ourselves uh, learning analytics experts because we are capturing data, we are analyzing, we are creating reports, and we're translating them into actions. If we take the next step and make a prediction model and we bring all the machine learning algorithms or the educational data mining uh, solutions, then those predictions, again, they need to be part of the report, they need to be submitted to instructors, they need to be considered for the design, or that prediction perhaps prompts certain action, automatic action that is in injected in the learning environment. We like this model a lot because it's very comprehensive. It captures a lot of variety of learning analytics elements, but it also captures all these overlap with the previous buzzwords we mentioned. Machine learning, let me see if I can use the pointer here. Machine learning would be mainly focused. Can you see that red pointer in the screen? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. Machine learning would be basically providing sophisticated, al sophisticated algorithms for this area. Educational data mining will probably provide sophisticated algorithms for this area and perhaps include the reporting as well. But again, you have to be mindful, especially at the leadership positions. If you want to deploy some scheme like this, remember you still need a sophisticated or reliable database to collect this. You, you still need to have a clearly identified set of analysis and everything has to eventually connect with the design and what you're trying to achieve here. And then the other very important element is that there are humans in the loop. These humans are part of the equation. They have to be brought on board as well. They have to be able to look at these reports. They have to be able to take some actions and these actions need to be injected either in the learning environment or related back to the learners. <coughs> We're not done yet though. This model is effective, is powerful, is very, very comprehensive, but there are still one more element that we need to take into account. And to me, this is the most important one. And this is this arrow that just appeared here all the way from the design to the analyze, predict, and previous data. And this is related to how academic developers think of these designs. We are typically used to think of this as a one-way street where we have the data first in here, we collect it in the database, and then we make the analysis, the prediction, and the previous data, right? This is the way we typically think about it. We need to start thinking the other way around. From the design here, we need to identify what does it make sense pedagogically? What does it make sense for me to include in my course? How do I guarantee that the students are acquiring the skills? And then let this design, let these elements drive the analyze, prediction, and previous data. Let me give you an example. Suppose that you think that motivation is a good element to promote in your course. So when you sit with your academic developers, you realize that motivation or self-regulation, it's a good feature to include in your design. The presence of self-regulation should then drive this analysis and say, by the way, whoever is in charge of the analysis or prediction, they should be aware that there will be information we need to know about self-regulation. And then it's when you have the design drive what is present in this learning environment. And you let the design influence what is capturing the database. And the design then has to dictate how do we make this analysis so that self-regulation is properly measured, predicted, and then the reports and actions are following the initial idea. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a second because this is a fairly complex model, um, very generic, but at the same time, I would like to gather from the audience if this model makes sense. Excellent. So I wanna emphasize the last part that Abelardo said, which is that we need to start with the end in mind, right? Those of you in science, right? We start with a hypothesis to do an experiment. Right? So this means when you do the design and the analysis, they have to be coupled together. Right? Otherwise, what happens is you end up collecting data that's convenient and not actually answering the questions that you have. Right? So you need to always think about this important part first. Right? What is it that you want the learners to achieve? What data can you go to collect to find that? And how do you analyze it to drive the action? Right, number nine, that you want to see uh, as a result of the analytics that you've done. Yep. Okay. Very good point. So this is a model that gets the bits and pieces of the landscape of learning analytics. But the other dimension that we have identified in a lot of institutions that is complex is people, humans. How do you get humans to 
collaborate through the different stages of this model. So let's unpack that a little bit. This is our first uh, model of stakeholder groups. So you're going to have a set of academic uh, developers or academic designers, instructors, and they are experts on pedagogical strategies, content design, delivery. These are the people that know how to create these designs. We have another set of stakeholders that we haven't mentioned explicitly, but if you ask me, they would be included, let me see if I can get the pointer in here. When we analyze things, this analysis is a sophisticated step, right? So we should take into account these statistical experts. These are people that will look at the data sets and will tell you, yes, um, there is a possibility of uh, detecting a linear model. And this linear model is stated like that. Or they will come back and tell you this linear model, even though it exists, it is not statistically significant. We need these people. We need the group of people. We definitely need the IT experts, and there is no need to emphasize on that. And at the leadership position, it's always a struggle to find out what is the best solution, what is the best architecture. This would be along the lines of what we have in this box over here. How do we capture this? How do we integrate this enactment of the learning management system together with the database? Another stakeholder group, very important, management. These are the people responsible that these different departments talk to each other. We have the leaders, which are the high level responsible ones. And eventually, of course, we have the learners, which are the ultimate beneficiaries of this thing. So let me try now to connect the two things. Let's see if it, that, this makes sense. This is the typical relationship we are finding in institutions regarding the stakeholders group. We have the leaders here that are focusing more on the operational way of things, on how processes need to be deployed. These leaders, usually have a set of managers from different departments that are the ones also moving beyond the operational, operational stage. Below the management, we move on to the innovation space. What happens in the schools? What happens in the university? And we typically have identified in the past is a set of what we call champions. These are academics, designers, teachers that are excited about the use of technology. And they are the ones that are usually trying to achieve the impact using learning analytics methods. Underneath, we usually identify three groups, and this is where we have the academic developers, the statisticians, and the IT experts. And under this structure of stakeholder groups, we just put the model we just described. So these people, these groups here, they have to talk to each other. They have to communicate their vision, their steps, their goals, their deployments in the context of what we just described here. Now, what I'm going to tell you about is a little bit of the distribution of these three expert groups down here. How do I see these three groups in here populating the different boxes? So it's a bit of an exercise for you to understand who would be involved in where. And let's pick these three boxes at the bottom. So this is my proposal. See what you think of it. I'm going to talk about three different groups. I'm going to call them academic for simplicity, and they're going to be the red ones. I'm guessing that you're seeing the colors, the statisticians, which are the green ones, and the IT experts, which are the blue ones. And the statisticians will also include experts in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on. Whereas IT experts will include expertise in big data if we need them, okay? Everybody agrees with these uh, three divisions of three groups? So here's my proposal. The academic group, they live in the northern part of this graph, mostly in the design up here, but also in the design constraints. They definitely, leaving here in this box because they're usually responsible for delivery. And typically, once you have deployed this, they will be very keen to look at the reports and very keen to suggest actions, okay? So this is my way of saying this group, this stakeholder group usually becomes expert in these elements of the model. Statisticians, statisticians definitely have to be here, right? Because they mostly do all the analysis. They are also experts on prediction and previous data. So these are the people expert in machine learning algorithms. They live basically in these boxes. And this is the interesting part. They typically have a lot of things to say about the report because they are the ones extracting the information for us to put in the report. And sometimes, sometimes they venture out in this node number nine and propose some actions. The statisticians can say, from my point of view, this model is telling me that you should do this. Okay. Finally, the group of Experts in IT, they definitely have to be here because this database requires quite a lot of infrastructure. They typically also are in this box because this enactment is technology mediated. That would be your LMS, right? Sometimes they venture into the analysis because this analysis sometimes needs to be 
some technicalities need to be solved there. Like how do I manage to um, analyze this large data set? You talk to IT experts. And sometimes, just sometimes even have something to say about the report because the report is usually produced with a technical infrastructure. And maybe some of them from that report, they venture on the actions. So as you can see, what I'm trying to convey here is that um, there is a lot of overlapping here, but there is also a lot of separation. And this is what we identify as one of the most challenging elements for institutions to achieve institutional uptake of this model because different stakeholders groups live in different parts of this model. And sometimes the institution emphasize one over the others. Let me tell you exactly what I mean by that. Let's now move away a little bit from the elements of that de detailed model. Let's focus on deploying and enable learning analytics at the institutional uh, model. So this is a study, the one you see at the bottom, we did a couple of years ago about how institutions are approaching the deployment of learning analytics. And we find two categories, the ones that proceed top down and the ones that proceed bottom up. Top down are the ones that I'm showing right here. This is when your leadership team says, learning analytics is a very good idea. We have detected the potential and we're going to deploy, right? And one of the things we have found is that even though it does have a very strong influence from above, from the leadership teams, they usually have a clearly articulated goal. The reason why we're gonna use learning analytics is because of this. They also provide quick access to institutional capacity. In other words, the leaders and the managers mobilize or mobilize the operational aspect of the problem. The typical mistake or the typical um, uh, caveat we find is that the learning analytics part is conceptualized as a technical solution. We're gonna put a data lake, we're gonna put a data warehouse, the data capturing is gonna be fantastic. And from there, we'll do learning analytics. And what happens is that usually there is one organizational unit at the operational stage that owns the problem and treats the rest as clients. And this has not been shown to be working. The consequence is very small uptake. So let me show you a different way of um, representing this in our scheme. This is the situation. Leaders are here very strong. Management is here following the vision of the leaders, very strong in the operational space. Maybe there is a little bit of uptake in terms of IT experts, but the other groups are not engaged. And therefore, there is not uh, a successful uptake. Let me go now to the bottom-up approach. It's the opposite. What we have is alliances are emerging, but among independent institutional units. Little pockets of innovation. A few teachers that they get excited. But these teachers are not enough. They focus on continuous improvement, on the learning experience, everything is going fine, but they have difficulties because they don't have institutional support. They lack the infrastructure. They lack the access to data. They lack the computing facilities. Very, very limited resources and leadership is not aware of these things. It doesn't see the point. It doesn't see the value. The mistake here is that the lack of a strategy prevents scaling these things uh, effectively. You have a lot of pilots, a lot of initiatives, a lot of people excited, but you don't have a, an institutional view. So the way we represent this in our uh, diagram is a lot of activity here, a lot of um, lone leaders, but these leaders are academic developers or instructors, perhaps a few champions, but management is not aware of these. Leaders are not resonating with that. And therefore, this innovation that happens in this level does not make it all the way to the operational layer. So here's what we are proposing and we are submitting to you a different approach. Uh, it's a framework. I'm not gonna go talk too much into this detail. I'm just gonna give you the brief overview. And it's basically forcing explicitly you in the institution, forcing explicitly the appearance of this productive tension. Bring together the leaders, management, IT services, champions, academics, bring them together around a common ground, around a common model and start mapping what are the needs, and start mapping what are the goals, identify the problem. At the beginning, men mentioned that you need to identify the research problem you want to tackle. Is it retention? Is it the acquisition of literacy skills? Then you have to deploy the analytics, follow your design. Then you need to deploy some research, some pilots. Let's study formally if we are achieving impact or not. And if we detect that we are achieving impact, then is when we are focusing on a scale. This framework has to be nurture or has to be um, agreed on this production tension. And what we envision the most effective way for this uh, framework to flourish is what we call the emergence of the commons. What do I mean by that very quickly? So typically, 
what we have is the typical hierarchical structure, right? We have leaders, management, champion, and then these three elements at the same level. What we are proposing is a network, a network that is going to be connected. And let me show you a little bit what I mean by this network around the concept of a boundary object. What we have found in many institutions is that some groups agree when there is some object they can discuss about. So one effective uh, technique that we have identified and we propose here is consider this as a network of stakeholders and then activate or deactivate the participation of some of them around a boundary object. Let me tell you exactly what I mean with uh, five examples. Example number one, suppose we want to focus on designing a course to promote literacy at the level of the design and, and at that level of um, goals, you probably need to engage leaders because it has to be part of the institutional goal. It, you have to engage management because these designs will have to be deployed and supported properly by the right institutionals. But also you have to engage with academic developers and instructors so that these designs make sense. So this is three of the six stakeholders group discussing one, what we call boundary object. And remember, this boundary object, if you think of the learning analytics model we discussed before, this was element number one and two, the design and the design constraint. But in here is the right conversation to make sure that this goal of promoting literacy aligns with what leaders have in mind, aligns with the processes supported by management, but at the same time aligns with the vision of academic developers and instruction. Another example, different type of element, but also part of the puzzle. How about the analytics that we need to include in our designs? Once we agree about the designs, what kind of analytics should we include there? This is another binary boundary object, another discussion, another element. And in here, the network changes. You arise the network and you say, okay, let's engage management because we still need to make sure that the right elements are in there. Let's engage the champions because we need to identify certain courses or certain high schools that will be uh, adapting these analytics. Let's maintain the academic developers here and let's bring in the statistical experts because we need to discuss what kind of analytics, what kind of predictions can we make in here. Another example, how about the reports and actions? This would be something that we need to engage definitely the champions because they are the ones that are gonna be reading them. But this is crucial for the IT expert because these reports will rely on a quite substantial element of technology. And we'll also have to uh, request the help of the stati statistical experts because they're going to be the ones providing the right elements for this report. And they have to make sense for the academic developers. So as you can see, you start discussing different elements, different boundary objects, and you engage different stakeholder groups. All of the stakeholder groups need to have, need to have a cohesive and coherent vision. Another example, it comes now to analyze the research results. Suppose you put in place your, your pilots, you get the reports, you measure your progress. Who do we discuss this with? Definitely the champions, they have to be there. Management has to be there because this is going back to the vision. Perhaps we need to brief the leaders, even though they are here disconnected, they have to be brought at certain level to discuss these research results. But also the statistical expert because they are the ones that can give us this sense of robustness of these uh, results. And another one, suppose that we wrote the pilot, wrote the courses, we identified the goal, it was acquiring <coughs> digital literacy, the research is confirmed, the improvements are there. The next difficulty is how do we scale this to the institution? And when it comes to scaling, we need again the, the vision of the leaders, the vision of management, because we are going operational. We need to have the champions on board because we need to get a lot of information about how they managed to pull these pilots and now make them happen at the level of the institution and bring on board, of course, IT experts because the infrastructure is gonna be much more complex. So hopefully in this very quick um, description, we'll give you a sense of both the elements of the uh, model, the elements of learning analytics, how do they connect with different areas like machine learning, artificial intelligence is just one bit, but then a sense of the bits and pieces that need to be connected all the way from the design and the academic developers, all the way for to what happens in a course, the analysis, the leaders, management, et cetera. So to conclude, I think I had an additional slide here, but I don't. Okay, so this is basically yeah, the last one before the summary. And it's time now for you in the audience to ask questions and see any aspects that need a further clarification for this. 
I'd like to take the screen back for a minute so that we can. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, that was the missing. That was the missing slide. Okay. So um, we we've heard from uh, Abelardo a lot about uh, designing the learning analytics and, and framing it uh, about the definitions. Also, we we drew an impromptu Venn diagram. Uh, we've also recapped uh, the relationship of the stakeholders and how doing it from bottom up and top down both have their uh, particular. Uh, cautionary tales that we need to be mindful of when we integrate it together. Uh, and then uh, Abelardo finished with saying that when we come together in this productive commons, where we uh, forcibly put people together that may, may be of uh, different departments, uh, there may be certain tensions that need to be resolved in an amicable manner to, to uh, facilitate uh, the development. So uh, I know Abelardo has to go soon, but uh, I think it's good to have some question and answer session. Abelardo, do you have a couple minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yep, no problem, go ahead. I found the, the learning analytics model very, very helpful. I think uh, it actually uh, maps up you know, the different uh, stages, different processes. And I think talking about who is involved in which part of the process is actually very, very helpful and very, uh, very clear and very useful. But well, no questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's so clearly presented. Thank you. Really appreciate that feedback. So we are also on that journey. So uh, Alset is on this journey of creating the right data warehouse, as Avalardo mentioned. It's a very difficult uh, step to make. Uh, we do have champions involved, there is management involved, so uh, you're free to talk to any of us and we can uh, have a, a longer discussion with you. And I think Abelardo, as president of the Society of Learning Analytics Research, is very interested in having a, a longer term dialogue with Singapore, and uh, especially <coughs> MLB. The research is I guess they're, they're still in, in the development phase, uh, definitely. They're not at the production level yet where we uh, rolled it out to our own students. Yes, uh, so they, they've, uh, in NUS it's been more of a bottom-up approach uh, for the time being where uh, we've seen certain champions try to field learning analytics within their classrooms, okay? But uh, to take it to an institutional level is very difficult. Because as you've already noted, when you come to thinking about learning analytics for a particular discipline or for a particular mm -hmm. subject matter, everything needs to be fine-tuned and the designers need to be there as well. Right? So uh, that's why the rollout hasn't been evenly distributed. If you think about rolling out a, a, a generic dashboard for everyone, then it satisfies nobody's health. Right? Well, don't think we are starting off uh, with the, uh, modern, uh, 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 system that can actually do all across all the subjects, yes. but actually we are more interested in uh, are that subject specific and even some of the behavior that we develop and we can actually take a look at learning and uh, usually which are the disciplines and subjects in the university that uh, Yes, so we will get to some of those use cases yeah. later on so we can uh, uh, have a, a better understanding about how they, they might go into specific areas. Yeah. So uh, we want to make sure we use Abelardo's time effectively. So there are other yeah. questions, Miss? Um, I'd just like to get some clarity. I mean, based on your experience um, in working with, say, um, academics and instructors or even designers, what are some uh, observations that you have with regards to very effective uh, designers and academics? Uh, what kind of characteristics do they exhibit? Uh, what level of clarity do they have that will actually make this work? Yeah, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, so this is a very good question. The best experiences I've seen so far, the most effective ones, are the ones that are driven by solid pedagogical initiatives. So what I mean by that is um, an instructor identifies or a, or a course coordinator identifies an issue. Let's say, for example, the so students are struggling with certain topics um, and we start unpacking uh, the elements that might be useful. How about if we increase participation or engagement with some presentations through video? 
How about if those videos get enhanced with some reflections? How about if these reflections, then we ask the students about their level of confidence about those reflections. All those discussions are about solid pedagogical concepts, right? So what happened next is the powerful thing, which is, all right, if we decide that uh, the students could benefit from additional explanations through video and then video reflection, and then a reflection of their confidence, can we capture elements about that? And that's when the discussion start affecting the analysis. We would like to have information about video usage. We would like to have information about the text that is written in the video annotations. We would like to have uh, also information about how videos are or these annotations are rated, are rated from the level of confidence. And this is when the academic developers or the academic designers are much more confident that the information they have is much more reliable. Okay. Then the statisticians come on board and say, oh, okay, if you capture those informations, I might be able to find some relationship between these variables. And the fact that we have these developed or deployed over a couple or three weeks, we can also detect patterns over time. And then the IT expert says, oh, in order to do that, I need to collect this data. I need to make it available to you like this. Uh, the students have to engage with the platform this way. It should be framed in this type of format in HTML, so on and so forth. These are the type of productive conversations that we've seen that are most effective, okay? Um, things that fail along those lines is sometimes the academics um, are dazzled by the presence of data and they think that they probably need to wait for the statistician to come up with some magical thing and that usually doesn't work. And sometimes they focus on the difficulties of uh, accessing data when they haven't framed the question yet, right? So if I tell an academic, oh, I like access to my video, um, my video information, yes, but what do you want it for? And sometimes it's difficult to access, but you don't even have a purpose. So the most effective ones, the type of discussions are when you start with solid pedagogical principles that then you unpack and identify the need for data. Question in back, yes. Uh, what are some of the caveats, challenges, weaknesses of this um, learning analysis? Is there any area of learning which this thing feels to cover? Amalardo, were you able to hear that? Uh, just partially. The caveats about what? Caveats or weaknesses of this uh, learning analytics um, model. And is there any aspect of students' learning that is not covered by this learning analytics present? Okay, the main caveat we find in here is the difficulty to uh, articulate these conversations between the different stakeholders. What usually happens is that one group gets very excited and tries to advance without the help of the others, and then they realize that they cannot move any farther. Uh, this is to me the most delicate one. Uh, the second part of your question is about, is there any other learning that is uh, not captured here? Yes, definitely. So this model has its limitations as well. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, aim at covering all learning experiences. It is more an attempt to capture, if you have the possibility of access data and perform some analysis, how do you embed or integrate that capacity into the design and deployment of an effective learning experience? That would be the way to capture that. Um, other things like, for example, how would you orchestrate an effective face-to-face -face session with um, year 11 students? That is still a problem that might not be addressed here directly. You still may include some analytics in there if you identify a research question, but by no means we're trying to capture here a comprehensive model of uh, learning. Just the one where you think you can benefit from the use of data. Yeah, so I think it complements what we are already doing in the classroom. It's by no way supplanting what we're doing, right? As teachers, absolutely. And, uh, designers, we have to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. It's absolutely. Just that now you have another set of tools, another access of data that allows you, affords you access to different analytics, right? But it requires uh, a larger, I mean, when you're talking about big data, there's also big people, right? Lots of people involved. So the structure for doing the analytics is more complicated. Yeah. So definitely there are some limitations, for example, privacy and ethics. We haven't really considered it in this yep. model, as well. but it is built into the paper that uh, you can read that Abelardo mentioned as well. I, I just have a question. Uh, in the learning analytics model, uh, at the design stage, uh, I noticed that um, um, IT experts are not placed there. So uh, is there a certain assumption or really, you know, there's no need for IT experts to be present at that stage? 
That's a very good question. Um, as with any model, this is a, a simplification. It makes a lot of assumptions. Right? Uh, from your comments, what you're envisioning is this initial discussion where whenever you are about to design a course, you should be aware of technical uh, limitations or the technical affordances that you have available. Then absolutely, by all means, engage the IT experts. So rather than using this model as a prescriptive tool, it's more a, a, a tool for you to think if the conversation is around the design, uh, we understand the relevance of the design in this model, which stakeholder group should be engaged at what level of what we are discussing. So by all means, this is not something that is um, limiting. It's just for you to start um, identifying what would be the relevant group of stakeholders for the different pieces of the model, and then gather around this boundary object. From what your question, what you identify is that the design, the course design is a boundary object. And this boundary object could be used by the IT experts as well to articulate what is needed. Fantastic. That's, that's a perfectly uh, feasible and realistic scenario as well. I think it also depends a lot on the team that's being composed, right? There are certain uh, people within the IT staffers or within the educational designers or, or the teachers themselves that have different personalities. So you want to always take uh, advantage, leverage their expertise, leverage their uh, passion in order to drive forward the learning analytics solution. Yeah. Another comment that I might add is that this notion of who owns the process, this is a difficult process. It's so multi-pronged. It has so many stakeholders that it's difficult to name someone that owns it. Um, I think it is better to consider some, like I said, some circular structure in which there is deep collaboration, clear leadership, but at the same time, involvement with stakeholder groups from all levels. Okay, so uh, Abelardo, uh, I think uh, we'd like to first thank you for all the work that you've done this morning. Thank you. My pleasure to be able to participate. Thank you for paying attention. And like Min said, if you want uh, any further discussions or any comments, I'll be happy to um, engage with you. Thank you and greetings from Adelaide, from South Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Abogado. So now we have had our summary and now it's time to break for some tea or coffee. So uh, we, uh, myself and uh, Alex uh, will be around to talk with all of you. And then we'll resume in about, uh, it looks like about 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Uh, so that we have enough time to finish the session in the second half. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now it's tea break time. So thank you very much for uh, Associate Professor Nivia and of course our Professor Abu Adu just now. So uh, I'd like to invite...